media research basically deals with the processes behind the creation of content and how that content affects individuals in society. Uh, it aims to explain and predict uh, behaviors in creating and in the impact of that content. Um, it started really out of psychology, um, probably in the 20s and into the 30s, sociology. Uh, the, the foundation of media research originally was in what's called effects research. What's the impact of media, radio, television, newspapers on, on individuals? And that uh, tradition has proceeded and it continues in those fields of psychology and sociology, although communication schools and colleges tend to do the bulk of it now. Uh, as we moved into the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, people began to look at the forces behind the creation of the content. Because if you could understand how content would affect people and you wanted to change that, you had to know why the content was created. And of course, uh, government policy is interested in that. So the FCC does things that, like look at uh, who owns the television stations and the newspapers in a market. Uh, if they're co-owned, what does that do to the content? Does it improve the diversity of the content? Does it lessen it? Does it improve the quality? And so we begin to look more and more at the factors like economics, the, the sociology of newsrooms, the psychology of people who created news. Does it matter if you have a journalism degree or not if you're creating journalism? And so really it sort of falls in those two areas now. What are the things that cause uh, mediated content to be created? And what's the impact of that once it's created? And if you want to be able to control the effects of media, you need to understand both of those. The, the original approach was called uh, the, uh, the bullet theory or the hypodermic needle theory or power of powerful effects. So if you consumed any sort of media content, it had an immediate effect on you and anybody else. Now, a lot of this came out of World War I, uh, where propaganda was used to mobilize uh, citizens against the war, etc. And of course, since this was a war that, that involved much of the known world and it affected both the people who were ordinary citizens and the armies as well. There was this belief that the media had a great, um, made a great contribution in shaping those attitudes. And while there's some truth to that, it's sort of overstated. And later we found out that the research was just uh, primitive. Uh, this was uh, 90 years ago. Our ways of uh, doing research had not developed where they were. So we went from this powerful to the 1940s where there were a lot of uh, research projects involving the army in World War II involving elections etc. And we found out that the media were not so powerful. There were some studies done of uh, voters for example uh, and what they found is that only about 8% had their attitudes changed by mass media during an election. And immediately well that was that was not very strong. It was limited effects. Well, it is until you consider the fact that 8% will probably swing most elections. And so whether it's powerful or limited becomes a definition of how, it becomes a question of how you define powerful and limited. And so then we moved into a moderate effects period when television came along because you have to remember that all this research started before television existed. And television was so omnipresent uh, and so seemingly powerful. We were all watching six or seven or eight hours a day that it had to be uh, much more powerful than just limited impact. And, and indeed, uh, it has, we did discover that it, it can have a powerful impact on individuals. But what we also discovered is that it, it depends a lot upon who the individual is and all the envir in, uh, surrounding environmental circumstances, and that some people can be affected positively, negatively by media, and some to a greater degree than others. So now we probably will forever be in a period of, of contingency research. What are the contingent, contingent factors that determine how strongly an individual is affected by their media consumption? Well, it, it varies. One of the things that happened fairly quickly is that we discovered that advertising could have a negative impact on children because it, it, they're very easy to influence as to what to buy. Uh, 
Uh, and we also discovered fairly quickly that, that children can't tell the difference between the ads and the commercials. And so if the commercials were for the same thing, I'm, I'm sorry, between the program and the ads. So the ads were basically the same characters as the program itself. The advertising was much more powerful, which is why government regulates advertising for children now. And that came as a result of research about the impact of advertising on children. Uh, the impact of violence in television, movies, video games is a lot trickier to figure out. It's quite obvious because we all know people who watched a lot of violence or played a lot of violent video games and maybe that was even you. And yet you haven't murdered anyone yet. So, so the, the, the impact of violent media has once again to do with all those contingency factors. Uh, if you're exposed to a lot of violence, we tend to model our behaviors after the things we're exposed to. But if you have a family that doesn't have a lot of violence, then that is mediated by the reality. It, we can tell the difference, most of us, between mediated and reality. And so reality will usually overcome that. Now, having said that, there are some people who are exposed to media violence who live in violent worlds. And so it reinforces that tendency to react to problems in a violent way. There are some people who have a genetic predisposition to violence. And what the media do is basically tell them that's okay, that this is a legitimate way to respond to problems. And so the, the impact of violent media on individuals is a very complex process. But the fact that it's complex doesn't mean that it doesn't occur. We just have to figure out the complexity of it and see if we can somehow use that knowledge to make the world a little bit less violent. It's not as powerful as initially thought. Um, what it basically means is that what we think is important is what, we've, is what we encounter as other pe people thinking is important. And so if your friends are talking about something, that becomes important. If you're watching television and you get all of this, this input, uh, for example, the tornadoes that have hit this year, that becomes a very important topic and we think about it and we talk about it and sometimes we act on it. So media do have that influence of creating the topics that we think are important. But we've also found through research that, that media will be trumped by personal experience. So if you're seeing something that's inconsistent on television with what you think is important, you will go with what you think is important. Uh, for example, uh, we don't have to watch television to know that inflation takes place. Television didn't tell us that gas prices are going up. Our stopping at the, at the pump did. And so it's our having to pay those prices that made it much higher on the agenda than what was in the media. Sometimes they're consistent and they reinforce. Sometimes they're different. If they're different, we tend to go with the things that we experience. So agenda setting is a phenomenon that happens. We do depend upon newspapers, television, the internet, Facebook, anything we consume to help us evaluate what we want to think about. But it also is a very complex process and we depend upon all the things that happen to us every day as we interact with other people to help determine our agenda as well. Again, it's a complicated process, but, but research allows us to estimate under what conditions it's more or less important. Well, uh, one question that a lot of people talk about is ownership of media. Uh, when I first started researching in this area 25 years ago, uh, most of the newspaper companies were not owned by public corporations. There were groups, there were many newspapers owned by one company, but the companies were privately controlled. Private ownership can do what they want. So if they wanted to invest in quality, they could do that. If they didn't want to invest in quality and they wanted to take as much profit out as possible, they could do that. But what we saw in the 80s and into the 90s was an increasing buying up of newspaper groups by public corporations. Public corporations have to please people who advise on the buying of their stocks, on, on big uh, organizations like uh, uh, tr um, retirement pension funds that buy stock, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to please the people who run Wall Street. Uh, to please Wall Street, you have to return a consistent high profit, especially newspapers, because they had a history of that. Uh, 
And so during a time where newspaper companies should have started to adjust to electronic distribution, they were still pulling so much of their money out, so much of their money, their revenue, putting so much into profit and not reinvesting in the transition to digital. And this is one of the reasons that they're behind. Had they been a, a private company and had they had the foresight to see ahead, which is not always a given, uh, they very well could have passed, uh, uh, done a better job of adjusting to electronic delivery. In other words, they might be five years ahead of where they are now. Uh, eventually it will come out all right, provided people still want what they produce. But uh, in the interim, they're struggling with that sort of aspect. So ownership determines strategy, and strategy determines your long-term success in whatever you do. So that public ownership trend had, I think, in the long term, a negative impact on the strategy for transition to digital delivery. Uh, we also discovered that competition has an impact because it tends to people tends to force people to spend more money on their product. If you're a newspaper, you spend more money on reporters, and you hire better columnists, and you, you use more color. You do all the things to try and make what you're producing more appealing. It's not clear, however, how you do that in response to competition from other media. Uh, and that's part of, again, the strategy and part of what newspapers are having to work out now. Uh, so the questions that we are really looking at now are how will people adjust to the multitude of delivery systems that they have? And how will companies be able to invest in those multitude of delivery systems and still be able to make a reasonable profit to stay in business? Um, the interesting thing is this is happening at a time where it seems like every year we get a new system to deliver things. And so it's a very um, unstable situation at this time. Again, you have to think that uh, in any business that you, if you produce things that people want and value, then, then you will survive. And if you don't, you won't. We also have to remember we, we got used to these same companies surviving forever, it seemed like. And that won't, may not happen. Some will. Some have ever already gone out of business. Knight Ritter was a huge media conglomerate that is no longer in existence now uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we have to be understanding of that, that complex, uh, unstable, changing environment. But that also offers opportunities for some people. If you can come up with a good idea and you can figure out how to do it and make it work, Facebook. Uh, then there is a possibility for a great deal of success. I'm going to move us over to the sports field now because that's a big event that just happened. Uh, a, a, the coach at Ohio State, uh, Trestle, was forced to resign and we may see the president of that university resign because they were doing things that were against the rules for the NCAA. Interestingly enough, that story was broken by an MSU grad who was working for Yahoo. He was the same guy uh, who broke the Reggie Bush situation at USC. And so what we've had here is a new outlet, Yahoo Sports, which has invested not only in just covering the events, but in investigative reporting. And he recently did an interview and said there are going to be some even bigger scandals that come out. So Yahoo did it for obvious reasons. They want the attention, they want the hits, they want people to come to their website. So there is a, there is a commerce in finding these things. But you have to calculate that into the process. You have to be willing to pay someone to do it. I, I think part of the problem now, of course, is, is all of this has been, um, the problems have been exacerbated by the, by the recession that we've just undergone. Increasingly, there are evidence that, that some money is coming back to advertising. Uh, it may not be as much as there was before, but if there are news organizations who are willing to invest the time and effort into those sorts of things, they will happen. And they always have, and I think they always will. But it's also always been true that, that everyone wasn't caught. Even in the good times, they're not caught. All of them are not caught. So we have to be diligent. Uh, we have to find people who want to run media outlets who see that as a function, not necessarily just for money, but because it's what they do. Uh, we have to graduate journalists who want to do it. It is not surprising that Charles Robinson ended up doing that because he wanted to do that when he was a student. So there is still the hope, but again, it's, it's an unstable environment. And in any unstable environment, it, it's difficult to tell what's going to come out of it. So 
as long as we still got people who want to catch the bad guys and someone who's willing to pay them a salary to do it, it will happen. My hope is that we will continue to have people who are willing to pay a salary to do it. The other thing is, I mean, I'm not sure that it will always be a, a click society. Uh, it, there's not a lot of evidence that demonstrates how successful advertising online is. And that research will come. And it may be that, like the olden days, advertisers are more, consist are more interested in having consistent people who are exposed to their message every day rather than, than just clicks on a computer. Or it may be both. Maybe both. Uh, it's, it's always been the case that, that investigative reporting gets canceled. Classic example was CBS News during the Watergate period. Uh, they were following the Washington Post and the New York Times and they had scheduled two nights of, uh, of extended coverage. I think it was five or seven minutes per night, which is a lot of time for, for a, a television broadcast. And they did the first night, and then the next day, the next morning, Spiro Agnew called uh, the head of CBS and mentioned that they had some stations coming up for license renewal. And all of a sudden, the next night's uh, uh, episode or, or, pro or portion of the program got cut back significantly because of that, because they were, they were frightened of offending the people who could control the license to their television stations. So, the answer is simply having as many people out there looking for it as possible. The more journalists you have, the more likely you are to get the stories done because every organization probably has different points at which you can manipulate them. So that's why it's important, as a matter of fact, it's an advantage to have a multitude of outlets. But, but we always have to distinguish between what happens at a local level and at a national level. Uh, national levels don't concern me. There are enough outlets there, there are enough journalists there that presidents don't get away with things forever. Uh, at the local level, where you have one or two, if you're lucky, uh, if you, it, it may not get done as much. There's not as much coverage, there are not as many journalists. It's easier sometimes for people in positions of authority or financial power to influence media in those cases. So again, it, it has a lot to do with the very nature of the community you're in, as well as the people who run the media. But if you're going to err, I think we're better off erring on the side of having more journalists than fewer. And perhaps that's the true promise of uh, digital delivery. Well, and, and to be honest, that's not new. The, the uh, original newspapers were not published by professional journalists. There were no professional journalists. They were published by members of the elite group in any community. Oftentimes they may be booksellers, they might have been the postmasters, they might have been any number of, of uh, positions in the community, but they knew that the community needed information and news about itself. And so they created it. Uh, it could have, it's sometimes handwritten and posted on a wall, sometimes printed and posted on a wall, but there weren't all that, I mean, it was not very fast technology, so there were not that many issues actually printed. They were shared, they were read aloud, they were passed around. So it's not unlike that, but the thing we also have to remember is that we need to be a little skeptical of how we appraise things. The outcome of the spring revolutions are yet to be determined in some of those countries. And whether or not generating public outrage is successful is oftentimes a function of, of how nasty the particular ruler might be. Uh, there are some who are quicker to step down than others. And throughout history, you see successful movements are the ones where the leaders reacted in a way that favored the people. The unsuccessful ones are when leaders reacted in a way that, that punished, killed, dissolved the movements. Uh, all we have to do is remember Tiananmen Square to see what can happen with movements. Now, you st now you have the advantage of telling people what happens with movements. So the real advantage is getting people from the outside in. Uh, but even there, there are limits. As we can see in Libya, hope is that that will work out. But if it does, it's only going to be because of outside pressure and the ability to influence Gaddafi through uh, the control of money and weapons, etc. So. So it's a wonderful thing, it's a powerful thing, but it in, in, in and of itself does not guarantee liberty or freedom. Well, if you want to be a researcher, you, you get an advanced degree. 
uh, if you want to be a, a researcher who truly understands the process, you need a PhD. PhD is a degree that's designed to create researchers. Uh, and so that's, that's what you do. Now research can take a variety of forms. You can do research for uh, companies, for foundations, at universities. Uh, if you want to follow uh, um, media content, journalism content, there's a website uh, called Project for Excellence in Journalism. It's funded by the, Few, uh, by the Pew Corporation and it has professional researchers. That's what they do. Some of them are former journalists. Some of them have their advanced degrees in research. Uh, but their whole purpose is to examine the nature of content that we get, and they do it in a whole range. So if you're interested in media content and journalism, it's a good place to go and see because they do good research. So there's that possibility. If you run a company, you need to know what your viewers or your readers, etc., cetera, uh, want and need. And so you need to do research. It's in, in the old days that I was referring to, it was much easier to find out what people want because you could sit down in a coffee shop with many of them and they could tell you what their friends like, etc. But if you're producing something that's being looked at around the world or even in a city the size of Detroit or Lansing, it's difficult to understand your audience simply by meeting some of them. So research is important. Hey, to, to some degree, research is valuable because it puts to a, a test the ideas and hypotheses we have about things. And so if you believe this is true, research will tell you whether or not, well not whether or not, it will tell you the probability of that being more or less true, more or less accurate, more or less reliable. And so it's, it's if you have, if you like to answer questions, and there are a lot of similarities between good journalists and good researchers. They, 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 both groups want to answer questions. The questions for journalists tend to be more idiosyncratic, tend to be more about emotions, tend to be more about people. Researchers tend to answer more abstract questions about groups of people where in many ways you sort of pull away the individual idiosyncratic nature of people and try to look at common patterns among them. Both of those things are important and both, both of them are interested and useful. Uh, so you get to sit around and think about these questions and, and try and figure out the answers to them. The thing that you really find out after a while is that the really important questions are never truly answered. You get a better understanding of them, you have a, 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 your ability to predict the outcomes of processes improve, you, you get a, a better probability of estimating an outcome, but then the environment changes. When I got into this, one of the reasons I researched economics is that uh, people didn't think that competition amongst newspapers had an impact, which having worked at a competitive newspaper, I knew it affected me and everybody else. And so I set about trying to figure out why experience of people was inconsistent with the research, and we were able to figure that out. And then of course what happened is there ended up to, to be very few cities that had two newspapers. So you had to start looking at, well, what's the impact of television on newspapers or the internet on newspapers? Uh, and why does that take place? And, and what are the, the variety of strategies that can be used under competitive situations? And so uh, I ended up recently looking at citizen journalism and how it compares to traditional commercial journalism. And so as long as you're interested in answering questions, uh, the world will always generate the questions you want to answer. Well, I, I think it's good to realize that getting a journalism degree doesn't necessarily mean that you want to be or even should be a journalist. The, the unfortunate reality is that if you want to learn how to write, you're better off going to journalism schools than most other programs at a university. Because journalism schools, at least accredited ones, still have small classes still aim at working with students as much as possible on an individual level to help them develop their skills. Journalism schools still try and maintain a, um, a level of accuracy uh, that is important but oftentimes not pursued in other areas as well. Uh, over time, a small percentage of our graduates actually stay in journalism their entire career. Some go into other communication forms, public relations, even advertising, uh, or anything else for that matter. Or some go to law school, some go to medical school, etc.
Having said that, it's not a bad degree if it helps you learn to think and learn to write. Uh, there will be a decline in journalism school simply because the demand's not as high as it once was. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to go away despite some of the things you may read. Uh, it will, it, it's important for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that a journalism school promotes professionalism. That is, you learn about and talk about ethics, and you learn about and talk about law, and you learn and talk about uh, things about the conflict between money and commitment to a community. And those are professional aspects that oftentimes get lost in a newsroom in the everyday hustle and bustle. Um, and that's unfortunate, but the reality is that, that universities are a place to think about those things and to form your attitudes towards them. Uh, so there's, there's that element that, that would not happen if you just went and worked at a newspaper. Um, besides it's increasingly difficult to do that, they won't hire you unless you've gone through what has become a minor league of newspapers and that are news organizations and that's journalism schools. Uh, a former managing editor of the New York Times who graduated from Missouri, which of course is a very good journalism school, uh, was once talking, he said that uh, when he was younger he used to bash journalism schools. Uh, he said probably because it was the thing to do. But as he got older, he also realized that, that it was very important because it allowed people, young people who might ha not have the confidence to go out and do this right away, to develop that confidence, to find out that they could do this thing that they wanted to do and do it in a, a laboratory, if you will, that allowed them to make more mistakes and try things that the, the outside world would not let them do. So journalism education will not go away as long as people in our society value journalism. But at the same time, like all professional, all, all areas of universities, it will expand and shrink according to what's needed in, in the outside world.